Great. Um, th these are my questions for you to discuss in a moment, actually. So do you want, could somebody just blank the slides for a moment? Would that be all right, just to, just to blank them for now? And we'll come to those in a moment. Because I just wanted to, you to have a chance, if you've got any questions, anything that you want to ask me, please feel free to ask. I've sent John to run around with the microphone, because he's been sitting around all morning. I'll just give him. <laughs> any questions? Why would anybody have an issue with the word discipleship? Uh, I, I don't know either. Do you know, I've been on quite a steep learning curve. It may be that we need to ask Bishop Pete to answer that one. But some people, um, certainly it's, it, it, is news, it is news for me, that some people don't use that, um, they just don't use that word. D can you shed any more light on that, Pete? Because I'm sorry that I'm, it, it's a word that I'm comfortable with in my tradition, but I know that some people find that difficult. And I'm keen that we don't put barriers in people's way. Um, I, can't, I can't really. I have bumped up against it. And when I've bumped up against it, it has been put to me that the language of discipleship is confined to the Gospels and that Paul and the emerging church in Acts don't tend to use it. They just talk about church. M my, uh, my response is... Yes, but the New Testament wasn't written chronologically as if the Gospels were written first and the Acts and the Epistles came after. Quite the contrary. The Epistles were written first and the Gospels were written down later. So for me, it's still an absolutely live category to think about what it means to follow Jesus. But that's the sort of thing I've bumped up against. Okay, so thanks for that question. And um, yeah, any other questions? Oh, this one here, great. Do you have uh, job and vocation as different categories? Uh, a lot of when you're talking about vocation, you talk about what you did and from popcorn making to a medical student. And uh, often in my job, I'm wearing a piece of plastic around my neck, um, there's sometimes a difference between the vocation and the expectation of the vicar's job. Um, so can you highlight how you separate mm. those two categories? Yeah, no, I think that's very true. And I think one of the challenges to us about this is it's very middle class. Like, it's fine to have a vocation as a teacher and a doctor. But in my home group, there's, I have a very dear friend called Penn. Um, and she, we have spent lots of time praying for Penn because she ends up doing jobs that she doesn't really want to do. And she doesn't really find, you know, feel that she's found what God's called her to do. So she's done a number of, um, she's, she, she's run, um, she's been responsible for waiting teams in pubs and bars. I think, I just think she doesn't feel that that is a really valid vocation, actually. But that's clearly where God's called her to. She's tried to apply for other things, hasn't got them. She makes a really big difference there. So I think, I think it's really difficult because we, the language of vocation is quite middle class, isn't it, really? And that for lots of people, they are ending up doing a job because that's the one they've got. They don't particularly like it. I don't know. We might find somebody who feels they've got a vocation to stack the shelves in Tesco. Um, and we have to be really grateful to those people because, you know, we wouldn't be able to go shopping if people didn't stack the shelves. So I think that God calls each of us. And that's what the vocation means. And he calls each of us to live our lives as acts of worship to him, whatever we're doing. And there is that very old-fashioned hymn, you know, who sweeps a room as for thy something makes that and the action clean, which is quite nice, except I don't think the person who wrote the hymn ever swept a room in his life. But, um, <laughs> that, but, the, but the, the sentiment is good, which is that somehow in the mundane, and let's be honest, you know, even if you've got a good job, like, you know, I... I work in the health sector, you know, it's quite glamorous in some ways, really, working with these leaders and things, but I still got to do the ironing, and I still got the dishwasher had a leak last night, so it came down as a puddle of water, and I, you know, needed to mop that up. There's, there's the sort of mundane of our lives, you know, we've all got toilets that need cleaning, you know, those are the things that have got to be done. So there's something about finding God in the everyday, um, which I think, going back to what Bishop Rick was saying about the people who came to plant churches. I think that kind of those those guys have more a sense of that in their communities. I think we've got to sort of recover some of that. 
I don't know if I'm answering your question. So I think a job is something that needs to be done. A vacation is our calling. And I think the challenge is to link the two up because I think the job is just as important to God and needs to become part of the vacation. I think that's how I'm going to end that one. Do you know, I get so worried standing up here. I just think, why don't I have some theological training? I feel like I'm standing on very shaky ground. So please, if anybody, if anyone thinks I'm well out of order, please sh- shout out because... As I said, I've, I, I really want to share and learn with all of you about this as well. Any other questions? Thank you. Can I, can I just add something, yeah. Alison? One, one interesting experience I had a while ago, just listening to that, was something about gifting, maybe. Um, mm. I was involved with Wycliffe Bible Translators, and there was a guy there who was their administrator. But for many years, he wanted to be a translator because that was more glamorous, more upfront. But he actually realized he hated administration, but he realized God had made him brilliant at it. And he realized in the end that was God's calling on his life, and he now did it gladly. So even within a Christian context, you can get hierarchies of calling, job, sensitivities, and so on. And he'd actually come to realize, I thought quite maturely, that that was actually what God wanted him to do. So I don't know whether that helps. I come from um, a background with a very Protestant work ethic, and I tend to be that way. And people who know me know I'm just always doing stuff. But is there a, a danger that the church actually makes it fe- makes us feel whether le- whether lay whether we're lay or ordained that we should be doing all the time rather than being? You picked up on my massive Achilles heel as a lady. Is a pr- if anyone wants prophetic ministry, she's in the front row. <laughs> Because that is that is you know that is it for me, isn't it? Is uh, are you d- you know what are you doing, Alison? Running around doing all these things. And I did do a seminar at New Wine, and this guy came up to me at the end and said, "I think you're completely mad. I'm going to pray for you. Everything you've said is completely wrong." No, that was an interesting experience. Um, there's a great book by a lady called Emma Ineson called Busy Living. It's on the bookstall. Um, have have a read of that. She's just been made bi- uh, Bishop of Penrith, um, but she is married to a vicar, they have two children, and she just talks about that. What, what is it when you've been called to do a lot of things? How do you make sure you don't flip over into earning our salvation, earning, do, trying to do too much, when actually we know that God calls us to a place of rest? I think how I think about it is, you know, Jesus was quite busy, actually. He, um, he didn't sort of float around. He had, he had quite a packed program. And wh- even when he took his... Dis- one of the things I find most challenging is he took his disciples to a, a place of rest after they'd had a really busy ministry time. And he got there, and everyone had come around the lake. Do you remember? And that's when they had the feeding of the 5,000. And I often think what it would have been like to be those disciples when you're absolutely on your knees and you just wanted a bit of rest. And then Jesus says, well, how are we going to feed them? You know, you feed them. I mean, I'd have been really cross. <laughs> and so I think that the reality of our lives is that we are often busy, but I think we also need to carve out times for rest. That's really important for each of us. Um, I was writing down some things earlier that I need to think about on my retreat, so I just try and put in retreat times through the year. Um, I don't know what your practice is. I'm trying at the moment to... Um, move to having a quieter time with God around tea time, sort of when I get home before I start cooking dinner, to stop then. And it's not going very well, but I realize in the morning, my prayers about like, got to get going, got to do this, help me God, put on the armor of God, what are we doing? And so actually, I'm only just sharing that because I know that for each of you, there'll be that, like actually, how do I get this into my life? I'm busy, but how do I weave it in? And I'm, I'm looking at you, dear friend, because, you know, I know what it's like to have a list that's too long. And how do we know what it is we have to do that day and what we can leave? And how do we carve out time to rest when, as we sit there saying, thank you, Jesus, for the peace of your spirit. What am I going to cook for supper? Oh, no, I forgot that it was my sister's birthday. You know, I know what that's like in our minds. It, it's, a, it's a struggle, but I think that's part of our human nature and how God calls us to be. So we're not saved by works. We're saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus. So uh, we are human beings, not human doings. But God calls us still to be active for him. Is that okay? Anybody else got any wisdom on that that they must share? Thank you. Yes, Mary. 
Um, just, I was just thinking as you were speaking that, thinking back to what Rick said earlier, um, when we start to see all of our life activities as part of our expression of faith, rather than that bit we just do on Sundays, then actually some of that pressure to do things for church changes, and it changes its nature, because the, the doing it for church, as Rick said, it doing it for the building, almost. Whereas if we're doing it as an expression of our faith throughout Monday to Saturday, then some of that busyness, some of that pressure to do church stuff doesn't go away exactly, but its nature changes. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. And I think if you're feeling tired and cross about doing things, then I just encourage you to stop. Go away and pray and ask God to give you the energy. Um, I think God doesn't want us to be cross about what we're doing or upset. So I think we should get into some questions, actually, for all of you, so everyone can join in the discussion. So um, with the people around you in twos or threes here, um, just talk about what's your experience of this. And also talk about what did you, what happened in your church on Sunday? Did any of this creep in? What, what was the sermon about? What were the prayers about? Um, and it'd be good to hear back some good and some bad stories just to find out what the reality is. So we'll have about sort of five minutes or so. What's it? It's, so just before 10 to, I'll call you back and then we can hear from a few people.
Great. Do you want to wrap up your conversations? Um, love to hear stories. Anybody heard anything that they thought was particularly interesting or surprising? Who'd like to? We're not going to have time to hear back, obviously, from everybody, but it would be really good to hear your voices. And this is part of my passion, too, in the church, that, um, that you know, everybody, you guys have got fantastic, interesting stories, and this is your moment to share, so please take it. Who'd like to share something back? Ah. Oh. Thank you so much, my friend in the turquoise jumper. I was, actually, I was going to ask this uh, before, but it does tie in with what's your experience of Monday to Saturday as well as Sunday discipleship. I'm semi-retired now, but I used to work within the financial services se sector. Uh, I'm also a deputy church warden. I've been a warden for quite, for, for quite some time. However, during my working week, I would make no hesitation in saying that I was a Christian and would make no hesitation in being a disciple in, spre in spreading the word. And I don't mind using the word dis disciple. However, particularly within the financial services se sector, I was virtually laughed at. It was almost open hostility. Uh, you do what type thing. Uh, I've just wondered whether you or any others have faced that sort of similar experience during your working week. Somebody said yes. Yeah, let's have the microphone down here. My discipleship friend in the front row. <laughs> Um, what yeah, do you do? I'm retired. I was a nurse, but to say that you're a Christian at work was quite difficult, and sometimes there's quite open hostility against you. Mm, thank you for sharing that. So this is also why it's really important that we pray for people in their workplaces, because um, it is, it's tough. It's tough. I, I, I'm very fortunate. I have a number of Christian colleagues, and um, I think most of my clients are, are pretty okay with that. Maybe I'm not bold enough. Maybe I need to be bolder like you two were, then I might experience more of it. Um, but, you know, I think when we are bold for Jesus and say these things, then it, it, can be, it can be really tough. I personally haven't experienced masses of that. And I've also had some, kind of got some good stories there. So um, I told you that my husband used to work for Coke, and um, he uh, was praying that he would be able to share his faith with his boss and particularly when he was praying, he had this picture that he was actually reading the Bible in her office. She was the president of Coca-Cola in Europe, and she wasn't a Christian. So this seems highly unlikely. Anyway, she was trying to say something in English for a speech, and she wanted to talk about laying a fleece. This was a marketing decision. She used the term laying a fleece, but she said it wrong. Um, I can't remember what she said now, but it was wrong. And Ian said, no, no, we don't say that. We say laying a fleece. And she said, well, what does this mean, does this laying a fleece? And he says, well, it's from the Bible. It's the story of Gideon. Who is this Gideon? So Ian does go and gets a Bible. And he's standing in her office reading the Bible about this story. And then he gets to the end of that bit. Just, well, don't stop there. You have to carry on. It's very good. <laughs> So he's literally stood in her office reading the story of Gideon. She's like, it's very good, this. It's very good. Let me have this. So he left her the Bible. There you are. So pray, pray, because you never know when God will give you that opportunity. So, and I'm sure that you two have done a great job at that. So I'm not saying those opportunities always come either. Some, I've prayed for opportunities and they haven't come. So in a sense, we have to trust God a bit for that. Anyway, I'm talking again. I want to hear from you. Um, uh, I've just been a housewife, that's all. No, that's Round fantastic. No, no, li listen, listen. Okay. A round of applause for my friend. <laughs> and I've cared for parents and had them live with us and all the rest of it. So, And I always feel a bit sort of threatened when we're in this environment where people talk about jobs and stuff because I just think, well, I'm just me. But in what we've just heard a moment ago, I just think we're in danger of uh, kind of like thinking, oh, look, we're being terribly persecuted and this is terrible. My personal experience is that um, whether I've been at the school gate or uh, I was selling raffle tickets outside the co-op for the village fair in, in the summer. Whenever you're with people and you chat with people, my personal experience has been that if the conversation leads you to a place where you, s you end up saying to them, would you like me to pray with you? 90% of the time, they've said yes. And sometimes they've been like, would you? Like, and, if you, and I've just said, 
Well, yeah, because I believe in God who hears and answers prayer, you know. So let's not get too down the persecution line. Let's stay bold and just have the courage to say, would you like me to pray with you? It's only, honestly, 90% of the time people will say, oh, that'd be lovely. Great. And, well, <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic that you do that. Thank you. Please keep going. Anybody else heard what other things people had? Oh, great. My friend in the bishop coloured jumper. Please, no. <laughs> um, I, I, hopefully you managed to read fruitfulness on the front line because I noticed you were having a snooze in the photo. But weren't you? Weren't oh, yeah, I was. I did. Yeah, I did sorry, read it. Yeah. Sorry, I was, was wondering which photo. I was thinking, oh, no. No, no. no, no I was absolutely, yeah. I was out cold on that particular occasion. I was just I have read it. It's great. We did it as a church and in our home groups. And I remember sitting in a room with people and it was like the light bulb coming on for all these people who had been coming to home group for a while. They thought what was important was what we did on a chur in church on Sunday. And suddenly you could see them beginning to see that actually where God had put them at the moment, what they did Monday to Friday was really important. And that all those kingdom values that they brought to the work that they were doing that until we'd used the right sort of questions, they, they wouldn't have been able to articulate that. But they suddenly realized that they were putting kingdom values into place in their work, Monday to Friday, and we were, as a church were saying, this is really important what you do. Because they were interacting with all these people who me as the vicar would never ever see. It, it, it was like that statistic, you know, 1% of the yeah. population know a vicar. So I didn't have access to any of those people, but they did. And they were making a difference uh, and it, uh, I'd value you know, that resource is brilliant. I'd recommend. Okay, so it's called Fruitfulness on the Front Line, and you can get it from LICC, the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity. And it's a book which I was, I have read, and I was reading uh, but sleeping at that particular moment. And also, um, it comes as a course for home group, and there's a little DVD that you can watch. There's this lady called Anne that does these funny walking legs, but she drives around in her car doing her things, and it's great. And there's some real live testimonies in it, which are really fantastic. So I really, really recommend that to you. And we also found it really useful at, at this church. So that's a resource that you can use. I need to say something about that. We've got a copy of the video, uh, the DVD, in uh, the resources centre in the office, but we're going to get a few more copies because um, we had LICC as part of our conference, as some of you will know. Um, so some more stuff coming. I haven't just got round to ordering it yet. Thanks, John. Anybody else? Should we move on to another question? Oh, yeah, there's a, somebody over here. The beautiful cross. Hello. Hi. Um, I belong to the community of Aden and Hilda, which is a dispersed ecumenical community, and we have a way of life. And one of the elements of the way is a rhythm of prayer, work, and recreation. Mm. Um, and we recognize that work is important, but so are the other elements, and there needs to be a rhythm so that the, the temptation to overwork should be resisted. Um, I wanted to say that... in. In the discussion, um, <coughs> I think there was too much um, connection between job and vocation. I think for some people that simply isn't a reality. A lot of pers people don't have jobs, um, but still have a vocation. Mm. Um, and in our group, Gina reminded us that our primary vocation is to be a child of God. Mm. Thank you, yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. I completely agree with that. It's fantastic. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, let's move on. I've got another question for you. To do you? Okay. So I talked earlier about this sense of um, David being able to have the skill that was needed at the time. People trying to put Saul's armor on him. What is that today? What is the Saul's armor that we're trying to put on people that's cramping them from feeling able or being confident at witnessing to Jesus, really understanding that's what they're called to do. So what's today's Saul's armor? What's getting in the way of people living out their calling? And then what will you do to equip God's people for Monday to Saturday ministry as well as Sunday? So just probably about five minutes or so, seven minutes, just till about five past, and then we'll hear back about that.
Shall we um, come back together? So just finish your conversations. And um, Any thoughts on those questions people want to share? I feel much better down here with all of you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. There's a lady. It's Carol. Are you Carol? Yes. <laughs> I met Carol earlier. I was just trying to think uh, Saul's armour was a bit over the top and unnecessary. And, and I think uh, an example that we find in our Christian lives are when people are praying out loud and some people feel the need to use big words and things that other people don't understand, whereas I believe you just need to talk to Jesus like a brother or a friend. You don't need to use big words. It's just to make yourself look big. I think that's really helpful, isn't it? We must avoid jargon, and I apologise. if ever I, I'm sure I've used jargon, because I completely agree with you, Carol, but it slips in, doesn't it? So let's, let's call each other out on that. That's, that's true. We need to bring every day in and not make it all kind of special and fancy. Uh, actually, our faith is, is every day, and we can use everyday language for that. So um, just like Bishop Pete did earlier on when he was commissioning the Dean for Women. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody over here. Oh, is there somebody in the middle? I don't mind who, just somebody, anybody. I was going to say about expectations, about people's expectations on you. Because I'm a lay reader. Mm. And, um, you know, people have, and I think I have my own expectations of what I'm supposed to do as well. So I feel like, oh, I've done this, but I really should be doing that as well. And I should be doing that as well. And. It's like expectation of what you have to do. Yeah, and what else are you apart from a lay reader? What do you do the rest of the week? Um, I work full-time as an administrator in the university. Mm. So, and I have a family of two teenage daughters as well. So those things are really so important. <laughs> God needs yeah. you there too. Yeah, mm. thank but you. But I still have a self-expectation, I think, sometimes. And, you know, other people saying things like, oh, you haven't done this quite right, or can you do this as well? So I think that's... We ha all have that in church. Yeah. Thank you very much. So is there somebody? I know there's some people over here. Where's your microphone then, John? Oh, you got it there? Oh, very good. Sorry, we're going over here now. Nice, nice lovely pink jumper. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying, I work for the NHS, and I think part of the problem there is actually their attitude towards Christians within the workplace, because I work out in the community where we're not allowed to pray with people, we're not allowed to speak about our Christian faith, um, with the view is that you don't put your views onto other people. Uh, so in a way, that that's almost silencing people. Um, and the way I tend to get around it, if, if people ask me questions, then I will give a response to that. And it's amazing, actually, how God will bring it up in the work I do, where mm. it will uh, bring a direct question up from somebody I've just met. Mm. And I can respond I in that way. But it, it does feel a bit pressurised because you're thinking, I've got to be so careful, you know, which, which is a, a shame. So that's for, you know, people in that type of situation. Mm. That is, is hard to, to deal with sometimes. Mm. But... The great thing is, though, you know, we can all of us pray any place, any time, anywhere. No one needs to know that we're doing it. So you can pray when you're in that person's house. Ian, they don't, you know, what you do in your own mind with God, no one knows about. So I know it's tough sometimes, but you are making a difference by doing that. I'm absolutely sure of it. God is with you and hears you. I'm sure of it. Next. I think it's me. I've just popped a mint in, but I'll try and speak properly. Oh, <laughs> hi, Darren. <laughs> hi there. I was just going to say, I mean, it, it's it's good to do, the, I was I'm bringing up to the next one, actually. The yeah, please do. Yeah. yeah. Um, good to do stuff on a Sunday morning and, and, and gathered worship. But, mm. I mean, my experience when I, I was um, in laity and, and not wearing the collar um, was small groups was the, a, a real place of great support, you know, because you can really get a more intimate relationship with people in that environment. And, and uh, people tend to remember more about what you prayed for the, the week before and and um, you know, say, how, how did it go? You know, like difficult meeting you were having on, on Wednesday. How, how did that go? And well, it went difficult. Or well, let's pray about it again. You know, and um, uh, and, and I think uh, working together in a, a smaller group on being purposeful about 
uh, how we work out our discipleship, it, it can be really helpful. I really agree with that. Yeah. And um, I just really encourage those of you who also are responsible for choosing or writing small group material, please make sure that there's, um, you know, half the time is applying what the Bible is saying. Because I get very frustrated sometimes with what comes for small group discussion because it's just, it's all, again, quite can be quite church focused or quite individual and doesn't challenge us to think about how co- are we going to implement that? How are we going to put that into practice? How are you going to do that in your meeting? How are you going to do that with a colleague that you don't like? How are you going to do that with a manager who um, you know is dishonest? How are you, what are you going to do? And I think we need to be wrestling with those issues as all of us as a church and, and small group is the place to do that. So I completely agree with that. And we've, in our small group, we've had this guy involved with a bank in the Far East and uh, it's basically with Russian corruption and it's been really, really tough for him and actually praying that through. And uh, there are no easy answers, as some of you have said, but actually being face to face and being able to pray into that evil, you, you, I really believe that's what we have to do and we have to apply the Bible into that situation. Thank you. Well, why don't you use this one? Um, so I'm part of the Casillo movement, um, and in fact, uh, and one of the things we've done in this diocese very recently is um, we looked at the small group um, methodology. So we've actually produced a card. It came out at the diocesan conference. It's available on the diocese website, um, which is actually really it's perfect for encouraging people in small groups to meet together, not to do a great big Bible study, but to share where has God been in my life recently since last time we met, what am I actually, what have I learned about God or about my Christian life? And the last thing is, what am I actually doing about it? What, what action, where is my action orientation? Um, and it's, it's a really nice, very simple way, I think, of encouraging people not to talk about church, but to talk about themselves, their own lives, and where Jesus is in that context. So I'd, I'd recommend that to anybody. And it's on the Darson website. Go there. And... Um, this is your lady <laughs> and just on that um, one of the things that I've noticed it was Bishop Rachel who pointed this out when she goes and I don't know if this is the same for you Pete but she goes to visit churches she says to someone what do you do and they say oh I do I do the flowers and I help with the coffee on the second Sunday and she says no no what do you do and eventually it's like well actually I'm a full time carer or um, actually I lost my job last week and or so, you know that that's the real story and Let's, let's talk about those things. As, as churches, I've noticed it now, that when we get together, we talk about church things. We don't talk so much about what we're really, what's really going on in our lives. We might do if like someone's sick or they need praying. We're better about that. But we don't, I don't talk much about my work life when I'm in church with my friends. I talk about church stuff. And so I'm saying this as much to myself. But let's talk about real things because that's, that's where God's at work. And that's how we can change more than just the church, how we can push out God's blessing further out. Um, I need to stop. Uh, actually, what I would like to do is to pray, if I can. Is that, is that all right? So let's, let's pray. Father, we uh, lift to you all the things that have been said and all the things that haven't been said, but which you've heard are in our hearts. I thank you for the wisdom in this room. Thank you that there is a balance between um, being busy and living for you in our work, in our lives, in our calling, and being still and resting as your children. And I pray that you'd help each of us to find that balance. And I thank you that you call each of us, first of all, to know you and to know your love, your amazing love. Thank you so much, Jesus, for what you've done for each of us. Thank you, too, that you call each of us to follow you Monday to Saturday and Sunday. And you've placed us in neighborhoods, in families, in jobs, some of us, in communities, all of us. Help us to be your witnesses. And so I pray for this diocese, for Sheffield, for the people here, Lord, that you would encourage them by your spirit, empower them, that they might be your witnesses not in Samaria and Judea, but here in Sheffield and Rotherham and Doncaster and all the different places here. And would you encourage and bless this diocese? And I pray that you would indeed rejuvenate them by the power of your spirit to be your witnesses. Thank you so much for today and thank you so much for your presence with us, Lord.
to ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you. So we've got just a few minutes before our closing worship. Uh, just a reminder to you, there are feedback sheets on the, on the chairs, so you might want to use the couple of minutes to whip through those and the uh, boxes by the doors as you go out uh, for those. Thank you. finish our worship we fix